I'll tell you, we're really excited because we have in the studio today a pioneer in broadcasting. He's the man, uh, the first DJ in these parts in Springfield, Tennessee. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Daddy O Show, the legendary Freeman Raglan. How are you, Mr. Raglan? Fine, thank you. Nice to have you here. What an honor, what a pleasure for you to be here. Thank you, thank you. It really is, I'll tell you. It's, uh, I'm sure... I said it a minute ago, and I'll say it again. You have forgotten more about radio than I'll ever know. And, uh, you know, uh, Mr., I'll just uh, tell the listeners, you were born in uh, 1912, 92 years young, and looking good, i got to tell you, he looks great on radio. <laughs> he doesn't have on any makeup or anything. Let's, let's go back uh, uh, a, a little bit, uh, Mr. Raglan, if we, if we may. And uh, talk about how, how did you get into radio? Uh, there was a man who was manager of L and N Freight Depot, and he had an office with an open window in the corner of it, and I'd pass right by that open window to get my newspapers off the five o'clock train to carry paper out, and I'd stop that window and talk to him. And I'd show him some diagrams or radios I had built and made them work at home. And we'd swap diagrams. And sometimes we'd swap parts. <laughs> and, and so he went up there and told Jack and Lewis Drone, the Drone brothers, that I knew as much about radio as he did, that we swapped parts and, and both of us built radios. And so they hired me to come and install what they sold new. When they sold a new radio, they sold an antenna kit to go with it, a ground rod and a, and a wire to go in from the ground rod to the radio and an antenna to go on top of the house, a single wire antenna across the top of the house. And so every time they'd sell a new radio, they'd pay me to go install it and put up the antenna and drive the ground rod and hook it up. And so I'd go up there every evening after school and, and uh, carry a radio somewhere that they'd sold and install it for them. And they'd pay me for installing it. And so I enjoyed doing it. Well, now, is it true that you built radios so that you could hear Big Ben? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I built a shortwave radio, and I tuned it to London, England. And at 9 o'clock when I went to my bedroom to put on my pajamas and go to bed, I'd turn on my radio, shortwave radio. And at 9 o'clock in, in Springfield, it was... It was 12 o'clock in England. To, to be exact point, the, the point was Memphis, Tennessee, and, and, and England, London, England. And you could actually hear Big Ben. And I could hear Big Ben. Uh, <laughs> when they signed off at 12 o'clock, they verbally signed off about two and a half minutes before that. And then they played a recording of a man singing Good Night, Irene. And then they opened the window and held the microphone in front of the window so we could hear Bing, Big Ben bong 12 times, and it was up, the studio was upstairs across the court from Big, Big Ben. <laughs> that is an amazing story. Now, you know, when you, when you got into this, and, and you got into selling the radio, well, actually uh, putting up the antennas and everything, I guess uh, back in those days, that's how the reason for the radio station you had to broadcast so these people bought it had something to listen to right <laughs> <laughs> so you had to work both ends of it didn't I you? had to work both ends and you'd come back and you can you remember your first radio show that you ever did no but uh you, you liked classical you played a lot of classical on your radio show yeah right? I, I like classical and semi classical music mm -hmm. uh, i must have had an ancestor that that sang in the opera uh, and sang classical and semi classical music because my mother told me when I was a little teenage boy that, that all of my people and all of her people like country and western music and says every time you buy a recording, it's either classical or, or semi-classical or opera. And said, I don't know where you got it. And I said, well, I read a brain specialist who said that a child could inherit three or four generations back, back and could answer questions the parents couldn't answer. So it must be you must have some uh, classical trained... Uh, relatives back a, Must have. <laughs> a generation or two back. Huh? That's, that's right. Okay, another question. Now, this is not uh, this is not related in any way to broadcasting, but uh, I want to talk about when you're. Wanted to ask you about when your brother was sick, 
Now, I'm getting, I've am got all kinds of little tales here. Your brother was sick and your grandfather had a mixture. Had a, a mixture to make him well. Do you Yeah, uh, uh, back in those days, a lot of children in the second summer got to where they couldn't keep anything on their stomach and they died. And uh, so Papa called Dr. John Freeman to come see about my brother. And he says, you're going to lose him. And looks around, here came my grandfather down the street. He says, what did he say? Just as he drove off. And he said, my father says he told us we were going to lose him. And he turned around to me and he says, Freeman, he says, go get me a peach tree limb with some good clean leaves on it. I went down the backyard and broke off a peach tree limb, brought it to him. And he broke off every leaf and laid it around and around in a big saucer. And he reached in his pocket and pulled out a bottle of whiskey and filled a saucer full of whiskey. And then he struck a match and lighted that whiskey, and it burned bright for a few seconds, and it left the leaves of black potash. And he raked all the black potash off in a, a long handled teaspoon and raked it in my brother's mouth and gave him a teaspoon full of water and washed it down and coated his stomach. And he waited 30 minutes, and he told my mother to give him something to eat. And so she had some scrambled eggs and bacon left over from breakfast, and she gave him some of that, and he ate it, and he kept it. And so he waited 30 minutes, he says, feed him again. And so she gave him some more, and he kept that. And then in a minute or two, she says, look at him, how bright he's getting, how, how active he's looking. She said, he, he he's, looks like a new person after eating that food. And uh, Dr. Freeman wrote it up and put it in the American Medical Journal. It made him famous. And that information saved no telling how many babies' lives. It saved a lot of babies' lives. That is an amazing story. Amazing story. Okay, let's move from that to your singing career. I understand you're a, a melatone. <laughs> well, a lot of the recordings I played, I memorized the words to the popular songs when I played them. Oh, I see. And so I memorized them, and, and I could sing them then. And uh, Francis Craig was... Had an orchestra with WSM, and he played every Friday evening from three to five the popular music, and had some soloists in his b band, and they'd sing the words to those songs, and I memorized a lot of them, and uh, I can still sing some of them. Is that right? You can remember some today. Uh huh. Sing me a little tune. Evening breeze seems to say, "Time to be on your way." Down where the sun goes down, and if you're late, she will wait right beside the garden gate. Down where the sun goes down, oh, Mr. Bluebird keeps hanging around to sing his song of welcome to that little shack round the bend. Means that's where your troubles end. Down where the sun goes down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I tell you what, <laughs> for well, 92 years old one, and remembering those words, you're doing better than I am. <laughs> when you come to the end of the day and the night calls your worries away, do you ever watch the setting sun and dream the things that you might have done? Do you turn from your work with a smile? Do you feel that it's all worth a while? As you dream of twilight on the way when you come to the end of the day. All right. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, we got to play a commercial here, and uh, then we're going to be right back with uh, our honorable guest, Mr. Freeman Ragland. Sir, it is a pleasure to have you here with us at WSGI. Thank you. All right, and we're back with Mr. Freeman Ragland, the pioneer of radio in Springfield. I guess Springfield's very first radio announcer. Would that be right? All right, close to it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's right. I think that's right. Well, I'll tell you, I know you over the years you've listened to a lot of radio. I guess you've seen a lot of changes in this business. From Yes, I have. And uh, what do you think? What do you think about today's radio? Well... T today's radio is not as great as it was back then because then it didn't have any competition and radio today has a lot of competition with TV and, and uh, other programs. Back then everybody would do, uh, 
whole families would gather around the radio, wouldn't they? Yes, they would. And it, it really made for a closer family because people spent quality time together listening to radio shows. They sure did. And, and uh, they listened to the Grand Ole Opry every Saturday night. A lot of them did. And a lot of them wouldn't miss that for anything in the world. And did did you uh, did you have guests, a lot of guests, local guests, come come to your show here when uh, you were at the – it was w, what, WSIX, was that what it was? Yes. Back? Yes, it was. And uh, I guess you would have people stop by to talk on the radio from time to time? Yes. And uh, I had a great big open window at the, in the station where it operated in the station, and they'd come to that window and watch us and look in and listen. Now, you had a lot of a lot of school – a lot of friends, a lot of school friends that would come by too. Would they want to talk on the radio? Would you Would you pick at them on the air? No, they didn't want to talk. <laughs> they didn't want to talk. <laughs> they didn't have anything to say, huh? Who did you hang around with when uh, when you were growing up around town here as a young man? Well, I hung around with uh, some of the older people that uh, could teach me a lot of things I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's smart. And, uh, um, well, you know, back then, how, how far, like when, when, and I don't know, maybe, I don't know how to put this. When, when you were first on the air, WSIX, when you first had the signal, how far did the signal go? Did it go countywide or would it? You uh, WSIX was just a hundred watt station, mm -hmm. but it, it went countywide and it covered most of nice for labor and their advertising was a lot less cost than anybody else's station. WSM had uh, 5,000 watts power, and WAC had 1,000 watts, and WDBL had 1,000 watts, and WSIX had 100 watts, so they charged according to their wattage, and they could charge a lot less. So nearly every business in Nashville was advertising on WSIX, and nearly every 30 minutes, you'd hear a new advertisement you hadn't heard before. <laughs> now, did you make up your own ads? You had to do that all the production, too, didn't you? Yes. I had, had to do all of that. And so, back in those days, did you have two turntables? or? Yes, I had two turntables side by side and a microphone in between them. And uh, I put in a new needle and played one side of the record, and then I put the a new needle in the other one and, and turned the record over and put it on the other turntable and played the other side. And I played a lot of the recordings of the Royal Canadians. They were real popular in those days. Oh, they, Guy Lombardo. Yeah, and they, they broadcast from Detroit. Mm -hmm. Well, now, you you're talking about chain, putting in a new needle. Did you have to do that often? I did. I, I put in a new needle every time before I played a high. One side of the record. Is that right? So the record wouldn't get scratchy and, and rough. Uh huh. So it stayed new like. Wow. I guess back then the needles came in maybe a box. You yeah, know? they came in a box on it, loose. Mm -hmm. That little short steel needle is loose and bright and shiny. And put in, but putting in a new one every time before we played a record made the record last and stay like new. So you had a lot to keep you busy. Yes, I did. <laughs> well, now how about commercials? Because I don't guess they had, uh, they didn't have. Tape, tape machines back then, did you just, all the commercials, did you have to read live? Yes, I had to read them live. Well, let me get real personal with you now, all right? I'm going to get personal with you. How much money did you get paid back in those days? They didn't pay me anything. <laughs> you they, didn't get paid anything? They let me be famous for advertising and, <laughs> and using my name. <laughs> Ray, Radio hadn't changed no, all <laughs> No, radio hadn't changed much at all. <laughs> Is I that was, you? You when you were in high school and everything? I mean, you actually went in and and, and did all that for. for I did free? all this while I was in school. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I'd come up there. I'd come up there in the afternoon as soon as I got out of school, and get the key to the post office lockbox. And the people that made recordings would mail a free copy to the radio station for them to play it and advertise for them so people would call for it and buy them. I see. And I'd go over and get a handful of them and carry them over to the station, and I'd play them and pick out enough of them to last two-hour program from, uh, from 6 to 8 o'clock, two hours of theme. And uh, uh, 
I enjoyed selecting the records, and, and I got a lot of nice comment about me making some of my selections. Well, do you remember uh, maybe a most embarrassing moment on the radio? Anything ever happened that really that that uh, maybe really embarrassed you? Well, sometimes the radio station would go dead while I was on the air on Sunday afternoon, while we had some studio artists, uh, uh, studio uh, operator uh, performers that were singing. I see. And the station would go off the air, and I'd have to disconnect a, a big high voltage condenser and connect a new one right quick and get it back on the air. <laughs> before they quit singing. <laughs> so they wouldn't know, huh? Not before they wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I guess there was a lot of that then. Uh, a lot of folks would get, come actually come to the studio and perform live, wouldn't they? Yes, they did, mm-hmm. especially on Sunday afternoons. And did they have church services, preachers come by? And, uh, uh, they had uh, t- church services. Uh, we used the telephone line to, to advertise the church and carry the microphone to the church and use the telephone line to, and carry the microphone to the church. And and, uh, and so they talked in the micro The program went in the microphone and came over the telephone line to, to the broadcasting station. I see. And how many years total did you did you spend in broadcasting? Do you? Oh, I don't remember. And WSIX moved, I guess, later on to, to they Nashville. Moved, they moved to Nashville. Uh-huh. Did you work down there too, or did you say, "Well, I'm not going all the way to Nashville"? No, I didn't go to Nashville. Uh huh. Uh huh. So when I went to Nashville, I was through. Well, what advice would you give me? I mean, uh, I'm a young man of 55, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to take heed to because you know you, like I say, you're a pioneer. What 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 would for myself and uh, young broadcasters? What ad- advice would you give us? Well, uh, I'd say. The best thing you could do, you could do, and the most profitable thing you could do, is sell advertising, and uh, and word it for them. And word it for them. And sell sell advertising for the station, and 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 word the advertising for them, and all right. Well, that's that's some good advice. When you say word it for them, you you mean. Um, the announcer actually write the ad ad up himself, right? Yes, or uh-huh. herself. That's right. Instead of leaving it up to, instead of saying, "What do you want to put in this?" Yes. And uh, I guess they're you know, they like that better because it uh, shows you know what you're talking about or know uh-huh. what you're doing. Is that right? Yes. Okay, yes. well that's some good advice. Now, um, I want to ask you about when you went and applied for a radio license. Tell me that story. I went and applied for a radio license, and there's a lady opened the bottom drawer of her desk and reached down there and pulled out a sheet of paper and handed it to me, and it was a ship operator. <laughs> the, the license questions was for a ship operator. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I would have passed it if I'd have answered one of the questions, they asked one of the questions was, if your hydrometer was broken and you couldn't test the battery, how could you tell when it's full charged? Well, the answer was, it's when it, you charge it so it begins gassing and then you charge it for one full hour after it begins gassing and then it's fully charged without a tester. And then you know it's charged without a tester. And that was the question. Uh-huh. Um, you know, when you early days, when you when you first started, when you, when you were about fourteen or fifteen years old, we we were talking about you uh, built the radios. Now, what what really got you interested into building radios, and 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 how how do you, if I want to go home and tell my son how to build a little radio, how do you build a radio? I took uh, I had mother saving the the oatmeal boxes, those big round boxes of oatmeal. Right. And I wrapped a couple of wire around them from one end to the other and punched a hole in it and pulled the wire through it. And I hooked the ground to one end of it and, and an antenna to the other end of it. And then I moved a, a little metal thing from one end to the other across that copper wire on that round 
cardboard box, and uh, that tuned it. So it's the station was so mm -hmm. I tuned it to the best place for the station to come in loud and clear. Well, what would you what would you hook the speaker to? Where was the did you you had to hook a speaker up to that too? Or yes, uh, we didn't have any speakers to begin with. We had headphones for a long time. We didn't have any electric radios for a long time either. It cost a lot of money to operate them. I see. It's all better operated. And it, it costs a lot of money to operate a radio station, a radio. And you just kind of, as a hobby, got in, interested in that, and you'd, you'd build one, and then you, as the, you'd learn, you'd... The first one I built, uh, I used that uh, oatmeal box, and I used a, a crystal and a cat whisker. Uh, what's a cat whisker? A little lever with a little fine wire on the end of it, and you put it on a crystal that looks like a lead lump with a little shiny places all over it, and you put that little whisker where it comes in the loudest. You touch it where it comes in the loudest, and you have headphones hooked up in series with it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, and so that that was the uh, first radio with it was a crystal with a cat whisker. And then the second one was a one-tube radio. And then I built a one-tube radio and used a telephone battery to light it. And I used a B battery to for the high voltage on it. And that one-tube radio, uh, I finally got Denver, Colorado on it just about the time it got dark one night. And the, the radio station would, the radio stations would travel further after dark than they would in the daytime when the sun was shining. I see. And out west, you couldn't hardly get in the radio stations at all out west until after, uh, till about midnight. About midnight was the best time to, to, to turn on your radio if you lived out west were you, to get a station. Were you very excited the first radio station you picked up? I bet you jumped up and down, didn't you? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I know, I would The first one, I... <laughs> I, I Turned it on on Sunday afternoon, and, and uh, tuned in WSM. This little five thousand watt station there, and a woman was singing "When the Ring of Those Golden Bells" for you and me. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you said this thing works. I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's amazing. They've been uh, making uh, making radios for many years. <laughs> There's still some I can't even turn on, and here you are making them. <laughs> and then I made that two tube short wave radio, and the short wave radio was a long distance radio, and I tuned it to London, England, and every time I turned it on, I, I listened to London, England. So that's a, just that's amazing to me, and, <laughs> and and that's the one you heard Big Ben on the two tube. Uh huh. And then, uh, and then, uh, the, they send the news around the world every day on short wave radio. Uh huh. It travels further, and so they send it around the world every day. They relay it from one station to another on short wave. That's just amazing. Well, you know what? I really appreciate you, you taking the time to come by here. I have thoroughly enjoyed this. But well, I've enjoyed it, and I appreciate it. And you were so nice to come by and give us some of your time. And uh, uh, Bill Gray is here. He's been in broadcasting for 50 years in this area. Uh -huh. You Mr. remember Dragon? me? Yeah, I remember you. <laughs> you was WSM a long time. Well, WDBL. WDBL. Yeah, yeah. And I remember when you worked at Storage Battery and Electric. Uh -huh. You worked with Mr. Reddick and you worked with Mr. Edgar Uden uh -huh. down there. I worked there 35 years. Yeah, I remember that very well down here on South Main. Yeah, I remember that well. And do you remember Mr. Hardin Kahn? Oh, sure. At the radio station WSIX. Yes. And John Browder? Yes, and John they, Browder. They were all announcers to you. Yes. Up there. George Lawrence. George Lawrence. Used to be the freight agent or here in town. And my daddy worked at the freight depot. Jesse Gray. And you remember Mr. Everett Cobb? Jesse Gray? Yes, Gray. Yeah. Uh, that was my father. Jesse Gray was your father? Yes, sir. Uh, one morning, Jesse Gray, Jess Gray walked right by my front door every morning in the storage by an electric shop. And I'd be standing at the door watching for the news boy to bring the early morning paper. Right. And I'd say, good morning, Mr. Gray. So one morning I says, good morning, Cesare Gray. 
He says, he just grinned. He says, you've been to see Dad Finn. <laughs> I says, last night. And he told me to call you that. Down at Guthrie. And he said he called, started calling you that when you was a little boy. Right, yeah. Cesar that was down at Guthrie, Kentucky. Cesar Ray Gray, yeah. Guthrie, Kentucky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you've been a great asset to this community. And we love you. <laughs> Thank you. That's right. And I tell you, it's... Uh, there's no one, you know. You're you're like the first radio pioneer. I'm just in awe that I've I've ever met. I tell you, I'm just right here talking to a real, real pioneer. And you know, I hope you'll come back again and join us. I I do. Anytime you want to come in, and take over this microphone, and you're welcome. You're welcome. My my microphone, my seat, yours here behind this mic. Anytime you want to. So just come on back up and uh, visit with us. Now, I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'm looking at the clock here, and we're about a, a minute and a half uh, away from the news. And, you know, I guess, uh, well, back when you did the news, they, they had the Associated Press machines. You'd rip it off and read that. Yes. And, uh, well, now it comes through a phone line here. We've got the Tennessee Radio Network news that uh, we have to bring in on uh, every half of the hour. So... What I would like for you to do now, and uh, you may be a little rusty here because you have, haven't done this in a while. I, I just want you to, uh, to uh, well, we've got to get close here, but I want you to, to introduce the news. I want you to, to just say, stay tuned <laughs> in your best radio voice. I know you got a radio voice. Stay tuned. Just whatever you want. We got the news next. How would you say we got the news coming up? Stay tuned for what? For the news. We got the news coming up. Tell them we got the news coming. Stay, stay tuned for the news. The news is on the way. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Mr. Raglan. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Mr. Freeman Raglan. Springfield's very first radio DJ, and it is, just like he said, it's time for the news on WSGI AM 1100. What a pleasure. Well, you did one.